You're on. So um, this is just an overview of things we're going to touch on. So first of all, um, what is success? What is What will success look like on Tinker? Um, then we're going to talk about a couple of maker spaces, um, an incubator, and then we're going to give you our recommendations, and then we're going to conclude. So as we were doing our research, we realized that we had to define for ourselves what success looked like for these different businesses. And for those of you that don't know, a maker space is a business that allows the community to come in. Most of the time you pay for a membership, and they house tools and equipment, things like 3D printers, sometimes a wood shop, maybe a metal shop, maybe an art studio. And it invites the community to come in and make things and create and innovate. So we said a successful maker space is one that actively engages and encourages <coughs> innovation and creativity through the community. These makerspaces often have returning members that renew memberships annually, and they also provide the proper environment and tools for their customers. So as we said before, things like 3D printers, all the latest technologies. So I'm pretty confident that all you know what a business incubator is, but um, if not, it's a unique uh, combination of business development processes uh, designed to nurture small businesses to their early um, and beginning stages. So what does a successful incubator look like? Um, we defined it as uh, above a 50% success rate for post-graduation. Um, so, you know, a lot, ultimately some ideas will end in failure. You know, um, some will succeed, but some will be in a stage of middle ground. And we think that um, these middle ground companies should be considered uh, a success. Anything but a failure. Um, they should establish rapport with other businesses in the area, and they should help to boost local entrepreneurship and businesses in the so the first makerspace that we wanted to discuss with you today was Artisans Asylum. It's located in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, it was established in 2010. It's a nonprofit facility of 40,000 square foot, so it's very large. Um, it offers memberships as its primary source of income, but it also offers classes, and that can be either an art class that a customer wants to come in and take, or a certification class to learn how to use a certain type of equipment and then be certified to operate it. Uh, they also have rental options, things like lockers and maybe desk spaces, things like that. Um, and it costs about $80,000 a month to operate. <laughs> Artisans Asylum um, has a really great uh, sister website, which we've included in our report for you. Um, it's all about how to start up your own makerspace, and it gives you a breakdown of how to pick the right space for you, what kind of costs you can expect, and how you can generate revenue for yourself. So this next slide is a breakdown from their website of all the different memberships that they offer. They have a weekend warrior membership, which is $60 a month, and basically that grants you all day weekend access to their space. They also have a few rental options listed there. Um, they have weekday, which is $100 a month, and that gives you all weekday access. Then they have nights and weekends, which is $100 a month, that's weeknights and all day on the weekends. And then their premium membership, which is unlimited, $150 a month. That's for the person that's coming in and using their space every single day. Our next business we wanted to highlight for you is a makerspace and an incubator. Its full name is Tech Valley Center of Gravity, but it goes by Center of Gravity for short. It's located in Troy, New York. It was founded in 2013. It's a nonprofit smaller facility than Artisans Asylum. It's only about 15,000 square feet. Um, we did reach out to two contacts that our account had provided for us, Laban Koblenz and Bob Bounds. Um, they were really helpful in kind of telling us more about how they generate revenue, and that was mainly through their membership options. They have three main tiers, which we'll go into more on the next slide, but they also offer a discount one, which I thought was a really good point for you to know as well. So like I said, they offer memberships. They do the same classes and certification classes. They also have a Thinkubator, which is a makerspace for children only, which is a nice thought. 
Um, they host networking events for their incubatees, and they also host social events regularly. And this is in the hopes of attracting a lot of potential donations for their business. So this is just a little table that breaks down their three main memberships and then their smaller discount one. The first is the associate membership. It is a one-time fee of $25, and then every time you'd like to come in and use the space, you need to purchase an additional day pass of another $25. The regular membership, $60 a month. Super users, that's $100 a month. That's the premium one, unlimited access to everything. And then they also offer a discount membership of $30 a month, and that's for any volunteers that help them out, but also any students in the area. So something to think about for Tinker. Um, so, Sector 67, um, I felt this pertains to your company um, pretty closely. They're out of Wisconsin, so they started uh, as a makerspace, kind of what, exactly like what you guys are thinking about. Um, they specialize in engineering, they have like rows of computers, some 3D printers, a lot of welders, a lot of heavy equipment. Um, but what I want to focus on is how they uh, brought in the incubator sector into into Sector 67. So just two years ago, um, one customer came in and they were trying to design an app for coupons, um, but they needed one plastic, a special plastic gadget that they couldn't create. So um, that like positively identifies the, the buyer. So they, need, they came to 60, Sector 67 to help them out with this. And so Sector 67 has worked closely with them in the past two years. Um, and now this company has kind of taken off under their wing. Um, and just like that, they became part of Incubator when they showed no previous interest in doing so. <clears throat> so some, some just tips and tricks. Uh, the International Business Innovation Association is an up and coming website. So um, they help communities enable their entrepreneurs to transform their dreams into innovative businesses that make global prosperity a reality. <coughs> So they have about two to 3,000 members across um, 60 countries. And something I, f I found was interesting is that this is one of the top websites that um, comes up into Google if you type in you know, business incubators. And it's, it's a way to um, find any incubator in the country. And there's not, there's not a single company listed for Rhode Island. So I think that it would be good for you guys to um, we can get your membership to this website because you would be the only the only name in Rhode Island, which would be a great way to get your name out there. Um, also, it'll be very important to weed out less serious incubates. So by uh, you can do this by developing a set of questions um, that tenants will be required to answer. So some of those questions could look like, you know, is this a good business in which anyone could be involved? Is this a business in which the incubated firm has resources and competences to successfully compete? and what is the best approach for the firm to enter the business arena and grow. So just um, our recommendations, once again, are to establish um, your business first as a major space and then try and um, bring the incubator aspect into it. Um, maybe it could, like six or, Sector 67, just come along without you even having to try. Um, you need to keep some investing in your market, marketing campaign and then remain active in the maker community so that you can consistently seek farming. And then as a conclusion, we would just like to thank Professor Joel Cooper for this opportunity, as well as Andrea and Todd, although he can't be here with us today. Um, it's been a really wonderful learning experience and we've enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next team is uh, <clears throat> Nonprofit Funding and Operations. This is Greg, Paul, and Christina. Sure. How do I ask? Sorry? What's the next team? Uh, it's, uh, we call it the Nonprofit Funding and Operations. Okay. We have an organizational structure. And we have two, one for you. Yeah, one for you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we are organization, organizational <coughs> structure and nonprofit funding. Uh, my name is Cole Rice. I'm Craig Goss. Chris Stanley. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Skunk Works. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to go into the background first. Uh, what a Skunk Works operation is is uh, essentially when a 
team of individuals separates from the original organization uh, for the sole purpose of developing an innovative new product or service. Uh, they are still part of the organization, but they're separated for the uh, purpose of positioning themselves in a different location um, to allow themselves to get different perspectives, which kind of helps creative thinking. Um, and essentially, from a business standpoint, uh, the reason for this is to kind of develop a product or service that shifts brand loyalty from a competitor's business to this other organization, uh, the parent organization instead. And some of the advantages to a skunk works, uh, the first uh, term that comes to mind is blue sky thinking, uh, which essentially is defined as an original or creative idea uh, unfettered by convention and not grounded in reality. Um, so it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, you're reaching for the sky with an idea or multiple ideas. Um, and that kind of just promotes, uh, stimulates their brain um, to kind of get in the brainstorming mood, uh, regardless of whether or not they actually want to develop prototypes for the ideas that they come up with. Uh, and the second advantage is that being outside of the physical walls of the organization allows them to, uh, I guess, reach outside the bounds of where they would normally be uh, due to kind of when you separate yourself into an area, you kind of have a new take, a new perspective on what's going on. Um, and that's the purpose of separating themselves. Now the one main disadvantage of a Skunk Works operation is the risk that it entails. Uh, there, it need, constantly needs resources, money, and time to be poured into it uh, for it to even potentially yield any outcome. Uh, and it's essentially a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can solve a short-term issue uh, relatively efficiently uh, if you get a good team together. But on the other hand, there's no definite yield uh, there's no definitive answer that will come out of it, uh, even though you're pouring resources and time into it. And now current trends kind of moving along the disadvantage plane. Um, current trends and opinions toward it nowadays are <coughs> that it doesn't really stand the test of time. Uh, businesses are adopting more of an innovative design kind of in their DNA in the heart of the business, uh, where they focus more on actually becoming uh, entirely innovative in every aspect of the company itself as opposed to just a separate entity that does all the uh, thinking for them. And that kind of brings me to the data uh, that we discovered while doing some research. There are approximately 32,780 employers in the state of Rhode Island and about 90% of those uh, have less than 20 employees. Uh, so the chances of them being able to financially support a Skunk Works operation out of their organization uh, or even supply the manpower is extremely unlikely. Uh, and so the next set, of the, the next tier that I'm going to go into is the next 8.2% of employees in Rhode Island, which have between 20 and 99 uh, employees. And now it's still more likely that they'll be able to provide the manpower and financials to support Skunk Works, but it's still relatively unlikely due to the small nature of the business. The third tier is 1.7% of Rhode Island of employers. They have at least 100 employees. And now we're getting more into the range of where a business could potentially utilize an organized uh, skunk works operation without having to worry so much about falling behind or uh, current necessities that they have to keep up with. Uh, but it's still not definite. It's just more probable than the uh, previous two tiers. And the final tier is the 0.1% of employees in Rhode Island who have at least 1,000 employees. And that's approximately 30 companies, three of which are Roger Williams University, Johnson & Wales, and Brown University. Uh, so uh, Chris will be going into uh, higher education partnerships later on. Um, but for now, there's only one manufacturing company who has at least 1,000 employees, and that's Hasbro. Um, so if you are looking for a partnership um, or a Skunk Works operation, Hasbro would be the place to look first um, due to their uh, excessive resources and um, availability. Uh, so our recommendations uh, for this section is to, at the current time period, kind of forego looking into Skunk Works due to the inavailability that most businesses have to expend resources and manpower. Um, but it's absolutely something that you can look into over the years as the um, shape of the state changes. Um, a vast ma uh, majority of my work this semester has been looking into the advanced composites industry.
and seeking out ways that Tinkerverse can best support the advanced composite industry. Andrew and Todd expressed their interest in the composites industry. It is a booming industry in East Bay, and uh, there are definitely a few ways, based on the <coughs> research that I found, that can be at least uh, can be an opportunity for uh, Tinker Bristol. Um, so my research spanned uh, all over East Bay and into some of the largest composite companies, um, universities, and trade schools, and industry employees. <coughs> um, so. Oops. Um, so based on my research, uh, I have a couple recommendations. Uh, the first opportunity uh, will be uh, just a basic machinery. Um, this would be the most probable. It's kind of basic machinery and space for a composites program. Um, this would be kind of a communal space for uh, uh, composite engineers to come in and kind of work on various projects they're working on. Uh, make, make, uh, composites engineers are at any given time, always working on different parts, such as Senate boards, mass rudders, um, that's an example of marine trade, but it could be other things. Um, and there's definitely a need for kind of a communal space where composites engineers can come in, work on different projects and network, and have access to specific composite machinery. I do, however, recommend that we kind of keep it basic, um, as you will learn, as more advanced composites get into, the more advanced the machinery and the more expensive the machinery is. Um, so that's my recommendation for that. Uh, the number two most probable opportunity, I think, is supporting IRIS, which is, if you don't know, it's a boat building school. Um, they have a very uh, established composites program here in Rhode Island. Their campus is actually in Bristol, Rhode Island, although they are going to be moving back to Newport in the next two years. Um, as far as machinery and space goes, uh, they have not expressed kind of any need for supplementing machinery or space. However, they do have things like uh, networking opportunities and the biggest thing is uh, they have a, um, a kind of a, a, a seminar before they take something called the CCT exam, which is kind of a big certification exam. Um, so they have expressed that they do need space um, for this seminar, uh, and that'll be about a week every year. So that's just an example in how uh, Tinker Bristol can best support IRIS. Uh, the third uh, most probable opportunity, I think, will be a composites incubator. Um, the reason that this is the third most probable is it will take a significant amount of uh, time and resources. We are going to, you'll probably have to bring on a couple uh, composites uh, industry leaders as kind of mentors within the program. Um, but there has, uh, employees have expressed that there is a need for kind of a, a composites incubator tailored specifically for composites. Um, a lot of people that are in the business do have aspirations of starting kind of small composites businesses. Um, but as with starting any small businesses, they're kind of uh, hesitant with all the risks involved and would really like to seek out some support for that. Uh, fourth most probable, I think, would be a composites testing uh, kind of section of the makerspace. Um, currently, when parts need to be tested for composites, they actually have to send it all the way up to Maine. Um, the problem with that is they have to send it to Maine. And two, uh, a lot of the machinery up there is actually designed just for metal. So. Um, they're not super happy with uh, all of the results that they're getting from that. So uh, that was more so the bigger kind of companies that are interested in this. Um, however, the reason that this is the number four most probable is uh, it will require a lot of space. And um, some people I spoke to did mention that it would not likely be very uh, <coughs> convenient with the makerspace aspect. It will take a lot of space. It will require some machinery. Um, which will probably be hard to get and fund. Um, but it is probable, and there's a need for it. Um, so those are kind of my four top findings, I think. I was question, did you look at the economics of the composite testing at all? Um, I did not. Uh, define, could you define that a little bit more? We meant economics as in like the cost of the machinery, or? Uh, well, the whole thing, the cost of the machinery, what they charge for the testing, whether that's a, whether it's a profit center, or whether it's a loss, is it being now at a for-profit facility? Uh, I did not. I know that the, currently it's at University of Maine, so it's not for-profit, I would imagine. I did not look into if they charge or not. Um, I, yeah, I, I did not look at the exact amounts of that. URI also does some testing on deposits, too. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple recommendations. Uh, sorry, my recommendation really is that uh, this should be pursued as kind of a long-term thing. Uh, I think right now, I think the majority of our time should really be spent focusing on the makerspace aspect and the incubator. 
Um, I think while there is some opportunities here, I think uh, a lot of our time, your time, should be really well spent focusing on the incubator uh, aspect. Um, uh, we that recommendation comes based because we have a lot of research in the time and resources it takes to um, actually get that going, and also just my personal experience working with small business. I think in the first few years, it's really really important to really hone down and focus on your kind of primary objective of uh, business. Um, so that's my recommendation. So my goal was to uh, seek out partnerships in uh, higher ed institutions. Uh, I went with RWU, obviously, and URI. Uh, unfortunately, the engineering department here had no interest whatsoever. Uh, I met with Dean McTiernan in Gabelli and we had sort of different ideas on how to approach the situation. Her idea was to sort of outsource it to the career center where students would um, work at Tinker through the internship program uh, for credit. My idea would be to structure in a way that this class is, so you would have students essentially act as consultants. And it could be anything from a finance major to a marketing major. Um, so it would sort of be similar to that. Uh, we didn't see eye to eye. Uh, but I also spoke to, to uh, Dean White, who's the dean of the School of Architecture. So the School of Architecture consists of historic preservation, construction management, and the architecture program. Uh, I think the initial opportunity for partnership there would be through the historic preservation uh, school because Tinker, uh, a lot of the buildings we're looking for to be headquartered in are historic buildings, so that's an obvious fit. Um, construction management, there's not a lot of opportunity there, but the architecture program, um, and Dean White um, confirmed this, there, there would be a lot of uh, potential there. So I was looking at different models, um, mainly Brown University, but also UVA. They have these sort of research studios that are long term, um, usually longer than a year. And within that framework, um, Brown has its own sort of makerspace incubator. Uh, UVA does not. But um, the idea would be that that course would work with Tinker on a three to four, even five week basis um, throughout the semester. Um, some concerns that he brought up, uh, and I'm sure um, these have been shared before with the Tinker team, are that uh, initiatives um, that need outside assistance are not usually the best ones. Usually the ones that can support themselves in the free market are more optimal, uh, just because they have the demand built in. Um, and he also was unsure where he stood um, currently with Tinker, you know, whether they'd be leasers of the space, whether they would be what he, he called it uh, innovators, which would essentially be partners with the businesses in Tinker and there'd be profit sharing there, or whether they would need to write a grant to Tinker. Um, so obviously for a partnership to flourish, it needs to be symbiotic. So a lot of, all these people I spoke to Essentially, what it boiled down to is what can Tinker do for us? And that answer is threefold. It would connect students, um, sort of what Cole was talking about, um, with the machinery. Um, to advance the equipment and machinery, they otherwise would not have access to because it's simply too costly. Um, they would have access to networking. And through my research, I've actually found that 80% um, of job opportunities are not publicly listed, they're actually made through networking. So if you think about that, that's you know obviously an overwhelming majority of job opportunities that are not made available to every student. Um, and also certifying students in this equipment, um, which is you know not only looks good on the resume, but is uh, looks good to prospective employers. Sort of like how a finance student would be um, certified in the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, so to go on to URI. Um, Can I just ask yeah. a quick question? Why uh, did you rule out construction management as a an opportunity, not an opportunity? 
Well, not not an opportunity. I just think um, historic preservation in architecture would be more fruitful than construction management initially. Okay. But I'm not ruling it out. I might be able to help you with that. Yeah. You spoke with the dean of engineering. Yes, at okay. URI. I mean, I'm talking about Roger Williams. Construction management no, they, is under architecture or engineering? Engineering. Oh, it's under engineering. I reached okay. out to yeah. five people. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I reached out to five people in the engineering school here. I only hear back from Dean Potter, mm -hmm. who within five minutes of my email said I'll pass on meeting. So it's sort of unfortunate that they had no interest in I get it. Talking. So construction is, is under engineering, not architecture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I spoke to two people at URI. Uh, Dr. Fisher, who's the department chair, and uh, the dean of the school, Dean Wright. Um, both were very open to a partnership opportunity. Um, and it would also be based on the, when I got into this in the report, the systems at Brown and UVA. Um, but the real opportunity lies in something that URI created within the last few years called the Engineering Entrepreneurship Minor Program. It has roughly 30 students now. They're aiming to get that up to 40. And what they focus on is learning about new product development, the business of engineering, financing, planning projects, uh, patents, and a few other things. So that would be sort of right up Tinker's Alley. Um, and Tinker would have the tools to assist in this program of theirs. Ideally, Tinker would provide them with outreach, progr outreach programming, specialty classes as a result of the sophisticated equipment that Tinker would have, uh, free for class instruction and or certification classes, and um, also as I mentioned before the advantageous networking opportunities, um, especially with the advisory council along with the relationships uh, with manufacturers in Rhode Island. Um, and just to get back to composites, um, he's uh, Dean Wright told me um, that his department is currently in talks with two uh, composite companies, Composite One and Marathon Composites. Um, now, in terms of partnership, I think the best would be mechanical engineering, just because the other, pretty much all other engineering doesn't fall under the purview of composites, so mechanical engineering actually deals with that material. Um, the one concern I had was when I was talking to Dr. Fisher, he brought up the fact that they're building a new multi-million dollar facility, which among other things, is going to house, uh, in essence, their own makerspace. So my initial concern was that it would be hard to convince URI to partner with an outside makerspace and then pay for that when they're already building their own. Um, however, Dean Wright did not share that thought. He thought that all, well, first of all, he's a huge believer in the makerspace movement. And um, he believes that each one has its own distinct flavor. Um, you know, specifically the maritime flavor here uh, at Tinker. And it, it, they all, you know, they're all unique. So they all have something to offer. So. So, I, I think yeah. Question, Composites One, is that a Bristol company, you know? Is that Rich O'Mara? Like What's that? Composites One is Bristol. Yeah. It's actually right up there. Is that Rich O'Mara who runs Composites One? Sure. I think yeah, it was his I first company he sold that and he has Core Composites. Oh, yeah, Core Composites. There's Core Composites, Composites One, and TBI Composites are really kind of the three big composites industries here. Um, there's also Gurits, um, Pulse Bars is very big. Um, the only one that works is in Newport, that's also very big. Um, those are kind of the biggest ones off the top of my head. We definitely have all those in our report, though. Yay. And speaking of uh, Hasbro, um, URI uh, has partnered with them in the past through one of their, uh, what they call sequences, to work on uh, non-critical problems. So that can also be advantageous. It's you. been so great working with you. Thank you so much for coming, Professor Cooper. Um, thanks so much, um, and everyone else who attended. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to check the audio on the camera just to make sure it's okay. Just so we can hear everything. All right, so our next group, and at the end we can spend a little time if you have more specific questions because okay. it all ties together, of course.